To reach the most vulnerable families in our country, we have decided on a temporary six-month coronavirus grant. We will direct 50 billion rand towards relieving the plight of those who are most desperately affected by the coronavirus. When prison personnel to lockdown, uh, the department and SASA, you know, or, already began to think what what will the implications of of the lockdown mean um, to our country, and so at that particular time, and I think it was quite a hectic time for for a, for a lot of officials in government, um, as we were all trying to figure out how this pandemic was going to affect us, things were changing on a daily basis. Um, and we were, you know, just trying to grapple with how to deal with the situation across government barriers. For example, as many will know, uh, the National Coordinating Council was set up by the presidency, and that was backed up by the entire structure of uh, national joint coordinating structures, which is literally the whole of government coming together to try and address the issues of the pandemic. Um, um, and when we went into lockdown, and I recall those very early day CEO, we, you know, we were meeting in, in Sasa boardrooms quite late at night because that was the only time we really had to, uh, to, to do this amongst our, plus our, our, you know, our daily work. Um, and we would start to, to, to think, because at the time we had this thing called social relief of distress, but largely was food parcels of a very small budget uh, uh, that would, would not be able to deal with the, the sort of the bulk of the challenge that we were, we were experiencing. Um, and we begin. We began to, to to think about, you know, if we needed to get income support to a large number of people, how are we going to do that? Noting that we're in lockdown, the uh, level five lockdown. When we went into level five lockdown, so Sussex offices were all closed. Um, we didn't have, so we didn't have the normal infrastructure that was in place. Um, plus, even if we did, we'd be having to reach millions in, of people who we never previously reached. Um, and, and even in with such as normal infrastructure, if we were to do things mm -hmm. the way we normally do things, there's just no way we would be able to reach the, the millions of people that, that we did reach in the very, very short space of time. So we really had to start thinking out of the box um, and, 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 and you know, how, how to do this. Plus there's the other debate, you know, how much money are we going to put into this? Although I think at that particular time, government was a lot more flexible. It was really a time, uh, as you would recall, the president also announced a 500 billion rand stimulus package. Um, and so, so there was a strong commitment to put uh, sufficient resources, well, not, I wouldn't say people would argue about sufficient, but to put a, a large sum of money into to, to, to dealing with, with, with the crisis at hand. Um, it was also a time, and I suppose, you know, one of those things that COVID has brought us together. So, you know, we, we've always sort of worked with other government departments, but we never really got things to work very well. But in this sort of, one could almost call it a melting pot, where you just had all your director generals, your commissioners of agencies, your CEOs of agencies, all in sort of this, this one group centralized in your, your net joints. Um, there was this very strong commitment to begin to make things to work. Um, and that's essentially how the, the, the various relief packages came to be. Most people only really focus on the social relief of the stress grant of 350 rands. But at the time, there was, there was, there was an additional relief package, which, which the, the SRD was actually one of the smaller ones. There was a 250 rand top up on on the existing grants, and for us, that was the quickest way. We, we realized that we already had 
the vast majority of poor households in our system. And the quickest way to get income into those households was just to top up the existing grant. So we've topped up the old age grant, the disability grant, uh, and the other grants. And we've also given, we also implemented a caregiver's allowance of 500 rands, which was literally almost like a top up on the child support grant. And that, that puts a significant amount of money um, into poor households um, uh, with, with very little effort because we already had the systems there. The, the CEO will tell us more about that, but it's, I would say it was a flick of a switch. It was a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but the challenge came that there was probably, uh, we estimated at the time between, between 7 to 8 million people that would not be reached by these grants. They were people in households that did not receive grants, and we needed to develop a system to reach those people in a very quick space of time. We realized food parcels won't work. And we saw some of the images, for example, in that first month of the lockdown, where, where, we, where we still had to do food parcels while we were doing developing the systems, and we saw the huge crowds that, that attracted. And, 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 and so that was not an option. We, that, we ruled off the table quite quickly. Um, we also realized we, plus offices were closed, we could not, we, we could not bring people into, into venues in any way. So the only option really was digital systems. And, and, I'll, I'll, and the CEO will probably come in and speak about how SASA had to very quickly put together this, this, this entire uh, system. You know, when we build systems, we probably take you know two or three years to build systems, test them, make sure they work. But in this particular situation, it was really about building, implementing, and testing. While the testing, while you you implementing and, and, and rolling out the ground, um, uh, and I think you know we've we've achieved quite significant success within about three months. We reached six million people we've never reached before, and that was the first for government. Um, I don't think many of our other counterparts, well, okay, let me not speak about our other counterparts, but I, but I think from SASA, we, we, we perform better than any other government department or agency. Um, um, and, and, we, and yes, we accept, it was a, it, it, there's a lot of exclusion errors, there's a lot of inclusion errors, but I think across the world as well, when one looks at what was done, you know, in a state of disaster, when you are trying to do something it's really a sort of a, a very rough and ready approach and, and trying to do your best under very difficult circumstances. We actually, I think, you know, many other countries look at us and say, South Africa actually did very well given the circumstances. Once we've sort of got the, the idea of what we were going to do, we were going to top up these grants, we were going to implement a new grant, uh, of, of 350 rands, and that sort of then led to the president making that announcement. We then had to quickly develop systems, but also at the same time we were also create, writing the rules. So, so in the social assistance environment, everything had has to be done within with, with, within a, the legislative environment. Um, and again, n normally writing laws in a normal, open, democratic, constitutional process takes about three years to do. We literally did this in about three weeks, um, where, where we, and fortunately we were in a state of disaster, so you could forego quite a lot of the, the normal processes like public consultations and so forth. Um, uh, but we still had to, to make sure that you know, everything was legally sound. So we had a, 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 a whole unit set up within the national coordinating structures uh, with legal experts from all departments that, that sort of triple check everything we did and, and then obviously with the state law advisor as well. Um, but again, that was a very difficult space because we, we had a concept, we didn't have a full policy or full idea and so we had to write laws uh, around this. Um, also having to, in license with us as well in terms of, you know, what is practically doable, what, you know, we couldn't write laws that, that would not be implemented, implementable. Um, and so we had to come up with, with a set of rules that would enable SASA to, 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 to reach as many people as possible, uh, to, but also to define the target group. In this case, it was mainly a, a, the sort of the 18 to, the, the unemployed people within the 18 to 59 space. Um, and, 
and we, we knew we couldn't income test them. We couldn't call people in to assess our office and ask them to submit pay slips or ask them to declare incomes. We, we literally had to just do it online and thus I would have to then do back office checks. Um, so we also have to create the enabling environment because our normal social assistance framework doesn't allow for, um, for, for electronic applications. So we had to sort of uh, suspend that law and, and put a new law into place that enables SASA to do electronic, um, to, to do electronic applications. Um, we also had to empower them to be able to access databases from other agencies um, and, and to, uh, you know, in the application process, get beneficiaries to give consent and declaration to allow for them to have their data checked with other agencies and even private institutions like banks and so forth. And the entire lawmaking process was also sort of write, implement, test, rewrite, re-implement, test, because we've changed it probably six or seven times as we, you know, we, we, we've implemented it to realize, okay, there's some problems with this aspects of it, then we had to tweak it. So I think one of the key critical elements, and this is also one area where, we, where we've been tested from a human rights perspective, and I think will become a very critical part um, moving forward with our social assistance as a whole, was was when the key question around asylum seekers was asked uh, by the Scalabrini Center. Um, uh, and, you know, literally then quickly just they took us to court on that matter. Normally we would, in a normal environment outside of COVID, we'd probably liaise quite extensively, but again, because of this, this was an urgent need, people needed, needed income support urgently. They, they, they did take us to court, um, but we managed to, we, well, we did go to court and we did sort of settle in court with them that we would open up our, our social assistance framework to asylum seekers. I think that was something we realized that, you know, in the circumstances at hand, there was no justification to, to, to not being able to, to provide um, the social assistance to asylum seekers. Um, and then after that, we, when, you know, there was a number of changes. We changed the income testing criteria. We removed some elements that we couldn't quite, quite implement well. Um, another big challenge then came when we when we stopped the bulk of the relief package in in um, after the first six months. So we had what we call the caregivers allowance in that, and when that stopped, and we only continued with the with the three hundred and fifty grant. Again, we created sort of a gender imbalance where we we a, a lot of um, caregivers of the child support grant were mainly female, could not access the three hundred and fifty grant on behalf of themselves. And another institution, the Black Sash, then took us to court um, uh, to, to challenge us on that. They lost that court case, but I think government did realize that the, you know, the problems that it created by removing one, one of the packages and one of the relief packages and only taking one forward. So in the second iteration of the, of the, of, of, of the COVID SRD grant, we then corrected that to make sure that you know there's there's much more fairness in 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 um, in those for those who apply for the grant and be able to receive the grant on behalf of themselves, um, we also had to introduce an appeals process, which wasn't necessarily there in the first part of the legislation, but we realised that that because you know we're doing this under the circumstances we're doing it, there was a lot of what they call in. A lot of people being excluded who should actually be getting the grant but not getting the grant as a result of these checks with the various databases um, and, and at, in the beginning stages a lot of those databases had to first be cleaned up uh, so that they were a bit more accurate um, but that then you know also forced us to implement an appeals process to try and cater for those people that were not getting the grant who should should be getting the grant and again deviating from normal practices we implemented an appeals process which was slightly different from our normal appeals process. Normal appeals process uh, normally allows you only to check against existing rules, whereas here yeah, we've done something which I'm not quite sure is 100% sound from a legal perspective, but in an emergency environment that, that it probably does fly in the sense that we implemented the appeals process that then allows for further and additional checks um, that, that enables us then to try and remove some of those exclusion errors that, 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 that occurs as a result of the first checks that we do.
The first most important thing to highlight is the fact that prior to the recommendation of the grant or the, the, the suggestion that we should implement this grant, which understandably could have been done by the responsibility could have been given to any other agency within, within the country, but we're grateful to the fact that it was, it was given to us as, as a sector because we have some kind, we have a lot of capacity and capabilities in terms of doing that. It's important to highlight that just prior, we had a, 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 a Brenton indicated earlier on that we have a normal SRD grant that we normally do. We therefore had to, to, to make sure that in relation to that, which was with very limited funds, we needed to make sure that we get our people out there to go and provide support in terms of food to people. But we needed to take that through uh, the procurement process, which was quite challenging at the time. I'm grateful to the fact that a number of our people actually went out there during the start of the pandemic to ensure that people had food and provided that. And as a result, a number of people got infected because it was at the early stages of the pandemic and we actually also lost some lives and lots of lives amongst our people. When the president made the announcement in April, and we were engaging, as you may remember, the minister then set up the situation room where we needed to make quick decisions in terms of what are the things that we needed to do. We, the, we at the time had one particular system, which is a mainframe system, which takes a long time in terms of making changes that we could utilize to do the additional, what we call the top-up grants uh, for, for the clients that were already in our system. Even with that, it was a challenge because it therefore meant that for the top-up grants, we needed to make changes on the system and the system normally, under normal circumstances, it takes six weeks for us to make the enhancements again because this is an old uh, mainframe system which you cannot uh, change quickly as you may in terms of today's technologies. So that's what we had to do first. And as a result, in terms of the mainframe system where we need, needed to put the top-ups, we ended up for the first month having a situation whereby some of the people were double paid and some of the people were not paid. So that's with regards to the 30 billion that we had to disperse to our existing clients. So that was done. We then recognized that the clients that were new clients, we did not have them in our system at all. That is the category of clients between 18 and 59. We therefore had to look at what was it that was quick uh, that we could uh, uh, actually look at as an institution to make sure that we deliver on that. We interestingly had a team that had been working on our biometrics enabling system to make sure that as people access our systems, uh, that is our teams, they can actually make sure that they use biometrics. We therefore fortunately had just completed building and implementing that system. We therefore had to take that team of consultants to come and assist us in terms of building this, uh, this, this, uh, this platform. We had had uh, proposals from, from a group of private sector people to say, can they be the ones that actually implement this? We engaged with the team to say what's best for us as an institution in terms of where we were. Could we, do, did we believe that we could pull this out, pull this off on our own? And after constant engagements in a short space of time with the team, we then uh, took the concept that the people within the private sector had come up with in terms of making sure that we digitize the whole process and believed which I still strongly believe that if we say we need to build the capacity of the state, which is the first priority of government, it was very important for us to do it ourselves as an institution because we felt strongly that it would help us build capabilities for the future, but also help us in terms of fast tracking uh, 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 the system that we used, which was a legacy system in terms of the learnings. Not that it was easy. We then had to go to the minister with the proposal of, do we outsource this or do we do this on our own? And a recommendation to the minister that we believe and felt strongly as an executive team 
that we needed to do it ourselves. Minister then had uh, provided us the support, which we continue to be grateful for that we should do it on our own. We therefore had to get back to the team and say, what does this mean? Uh, and fortunately, uh, I really do want to believe that our, our ICT team is agile enough and they were able to say, how then do they do this? And we had to implement it within six weeks. Yet ordinarily, as we know, when we have to implement systems, it takes years uh, for us to make those uh, particular changes. Whilst we're actually designing and developing the system for implementation, which had, had to be looked at in two different categories. We needed to look at the onboarding part of the system. We needed to look at the, 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 the middle side, which basically is uh, making sure that you process the applications that you get. As you process the applications, you needed to ensure that you have engaged all the different parts of government that uh, the team within DSD had defined to be the, the, the databases that we needed to look at, and the third part was the payment. So it was a huge value chain that we needed to look at, some things that we had not done before. After having started with the onboarding of the clients, we, we were receiving support to one NGO uh, that was providing support already on the normal uh, uh, um, health side of the business. As we started the process, on the first weekend, things fell off because the volumes were just too, too huge. And when the, uh, the, the system fell off just at the at inception, we then had an uproar from the country in terms of this is not working. We then also had to continue to engage those people that were providing support for the onboarding uh, to say what is it that we can, uh, we can do to make sure that we can increase the path. And as we were having those engagements, the question was, are you going, what, what, what is it that you are going to do on the payment side? And our view was, we have our core responsibility over and above processing grants is to make sure that we pay. And we didn't believe that we needed anybody else at that particular stage to get involved on the payment part of, of, of the process. We then had to go separate ways. Believe it or not, we then, at that particular time, after had, having already started the process, had to look for a, a different, a new partner to help us with the onboarding. Fortunately, GovChat was already at that, at that time assisting government also on the health side. We engaged them to provide support. They came on board and we, we had to then uh, shift gears and got them to, to provide us support on the onboarding side. So it was indeed challenging, but a very interesting and exciting learning uh, at time as a South African project that we had to take to get involved with as an institution. I think the exciting opportunity that this presented was that we can indeed, once we put our minds to it, as a collective of government, bring systems quickly in terms of uh, working together. We had to, fortunately, we already were working with Home Affairs because we, we normally would uh, validate, um, even on our normal grants with the Home Affairs system, to make sure that people that are applying for a grant actually qualify. But at the time, we needed to not only work with people that we've worked with before, which is home affairs, we needed to also work with UIF, work with uh, um, NISFAS, stakeholders that we had not worked with before. But again, because there was uh, the structures that were created by government in a form of net joints, were able to engage at that level and everybody understood that we needed to be agile in terms of putting in place what we needed to put, put in place. The interesting uh, challenge we had was we couldn't wait until we've engaged everybody and signed MOUs with everybody. We had to start with whatever information we had. We had, hence, uh, at initial stages, we could use just the information from Home Affairs, NESFAS, and uh, also at, from UIF, who were also, who also had a responsibility of doing their own grant. So this was the challenge. You're asking for, for data from people that are also 
have a burden of ensuring that they do the work that they needed to do. Therefore, in terms of the, the response time was not what, a, a, what could easily be achieved. And as a result, we had to do the best we, 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 we could with the limited information we had because on a continuous basis, the minister was getting a, a request to say, how many people have you paid? When are you paying? We therefore needed to make sure that money got to the hands of people as quickly as we could enable it. And at the same time, we needed to speak to banks because we enabled and allowed people that had a, a, a bank accounts for them to be able to be paid through banks. But also what was exciting is that we started using other channels that we had not used before. It's always been a challenge for South Africans to use a mobile banking platforms, but we, we, we engaged with the banks. And you can imagine when you have to engage with the banks, it, it means you must go to BASA, which is the association of banks, and engage them for them to engage the banks that would be willing to come on board to actually do this. Much as we may have 24 to 27 banks in the country, not everybody was willing and able to come on board in terms of being able to provide the support. So it was to and fro between us and the banks. We also needed to make sure that, particularly because uh, National Treasury said, when you use new platforms, you need to make sure that you manage the risk. Therefore, you cannot necessarily pay into mobile uh, uh, um, uh, platforms without necessarily making sure that you manage the risk. We therefore had to look at another category of people, which is uh, we call the risk mitigators, which is people that would know because they have assessed people in the banking space that were applying for, for, for solutions in the banking space. They knew as to whether they are uh, um, cell phone numbers were valid or not valid. We also needed to actually go through the procurement process to get those on board. Hence, in terms of uh, paying the people that had taken the option of us paying them in the wallets, it took a long time for us to start paying because we needed to make sure that from a, a supply chain process that all those uh, uh, T's were dot, dotted despite the, the emergency, because you also can't uh, uh, cut corners in terms of the supply chain process. And that created interesting challenges, but opportunities in terms of ensuring that in future, our people can get paid in a whole range of platforms. Hence, those learnings are things that we're bringing into this uh, current uh, framework that we're utilizing. The first key learning was that we could not only provide one platform in terms of people being able to apply because we know that not everybody in the country has a smartphone, but what we know is that everybody in the country does have a cell phone, whatever size or, or, or a, a capability that cell phone may have. We therefore had to make sure that over and above a utilizing the WhatsApp platform, which becomes easy for those people that have smartphones, we needed to create yet another platform for those people that have uh, less affordable or affordable phones, which are smaller phones. We then had to engage what, what we call the SMS type of, of loading of information to make sure that they can assist us uh, in, in terms of pe people being able to put the star one, two, three hash for them to be able to apply which is always very challenging because when you use uh, that system, it means you have to be quick uh, in terms of uh, using all the application process. And therefore, people kept on falling off and therefore having to reapply. As we're doing the assessment, you'd find that with just one uh, person, there's more than five attempts uh, in terms of applying uh, in terms of that. What was interesting also is the fact that because we have NDA in the house or in the portfolio, we then had to engage with them to look at how are we going to provide support to people that are in the deep rural areas that may not have one, may not have data, but secondly, may not even have cell phones for them to be able to do that. Fortunately, because the system allowed a one to apply for other people, a number of NGOs provided support whom we were engaging 
uh, through uh, the relationships that we have with NGOs and through the structures that we're engaging uh, through NEDLEC to provide support in terms of helping those that did not have access to, to, to technology to, for them to be able to apply. But what, what created a bit of a complication is the fact that in some instances, the applications that people, the, the, the cell phones that people used were actually a phones that were previously owned by people that had passed on. And to us, without seeing the person, our understanding was that now we have dead people that are applying for the grant. It was not always necessarily the case. It may have been in instances where somebody passed on and somebody in the family took over the phone without necessarily going through due process. So that created another a, a, a interesting challenge that we needed to work with. Uh, but over and above that, we had to engage an institution with works together with the banks that looks at people that ha have committed fraud in the banking space. We had to also go there and make sure that some of the people that needed to be referred were referred to that institution just to check that um, the, the, the fraud risk was actually managed because it's not only getting the money, the money out there to people. We needed to make sure that we manage the risk in the spirit of making sure that we, we give the right grant to the right person all the time. So that was interestingly tricky, uh, but created um, opportunities uh, for us to learn. And those learnings that we had when we are now doing the second phase uh, of the grant, uh, which we started uh, now in August, which was announced in August, we took all those learnings and we're now implementing them to make sure that we can do the work better and make sure that both the inclusion and exclusion errors are limited. You can't get rid of them completely, but we're also working better with the institutions that provide us the data. We now have, a, we have more data. For example, we have data from correctional service because we had an instances where people that were actually in jail were applying for the grant. We now have a, a data which comes from, which enables us to, to ensure that people that would work within government um, are not uh, able to apply for the grant. We get a data from GEPF, and now that we've agreed that, the data we will receive, we'll receive every month on the 15th to make sure that we don't constantly use old data. Last year, we had to. We had no choice because we had instances where people were hungry and we're still waiting for the institutions to give us the data, but we needed to deliver as best as we could, hence we had those errors. My name is Tando Pot Makubu. I started receiving grants, I think, around March. So how I started the, the Soweto Creamery business was uh, through the Sasa grant. I was receiving uh, 350 uh, every month. Eventually, I was asking myself, what do I do with this money? And then I decided to start Soweto Creamery. Our business is actually inspiring other people to open their own businesses and we actually employ four people. My message to fellow South Africans about the Sasa Grant is that they need to try and create something sustainable so that they can improve their communities. Happy birthday Sasa, uh, thank you so much for inspiring hope in, in South Africa. My name is Liseho Monzo. Uh, I'm a recycler. Uh, I usually collect tins from waste dumps and, uh, and bins. The SRD grant of 350 has assisted me uh, in terms of uh, transportation uh, when I need to go and uh, do some peace jobs at, uh, at home in terms of electricity for me to power. Uh, the necessary appliances. I would like to thank Sasa for, for giving us uh, the grant uh, so that we can cope uh, in this uh, pandemic that uh, the world has been facing uh, and for maintaining that human uh, dignity 
and right for, for, for the people. Thank you, Sasa. Thank you.